Ajpaj Mama here. I want to talk about adoption. We pursued adoption for several years and I just really feel like I want to get that um, experience out there. Um, just share some of the things that we went through. Um, I want to start off first of all by saying this is going to be very potential adoptive parent centric because the purpose of this video is to share our experience pursuing adoption. Having said that, I do want to uh, mention that in retrospect, I really see that um, all of our failures, what, what looked like failures from our perspective, I think ended up um, in the best interest of the kids involved. Um, and I also want to say that knowing what I know now about adoption, because I've really been educating myself, um, or I have educated myself more on the experiences of adoptees, I was very ignorant, very kind of uh, rainbows and unicorns, adoption solves everything, and um, I'm not going to go into details about that. Um, and like I said, we didn't end up adopting, um, but I do still want to kind of share uh, our experiences with adoption. So, uh, January 2nd, 2008, after a few months of diagnosis treatment, or excuse me, after a few months of um, tests, we got our diagnosis of infertility. I'm not going to go into details about that because that's not the point. But suffice to say, we were given basically two options. We could pursue in vitro fertilization or we could adopt if we wanted to become parents. Now, at the time, um, I was very against IVF. I had this idea that IVF was playing God and that we should just shouldn't do that. And it was a sign if we had infertility that we should adopt. It was a whole bunch of, it's a, it, was, it was a big mess. I totally don't hold those views anymore, but that's where I was at the time. And so I immediately said, okay, Let's go ahead and adopt. Plus, I had wanted to adopt beforehand. Um, anyway, so it just seemed like the obvious thing to do. So January, we got our diagnosis. By May of the same year, we had um, an adoption attorney on, um, I forgot what the term is, but um, uh, we had an adoption attorney. We had an agency working on our home study, and we had attended a workshop on, we had attended um, several workshops with different adoption agencies, and then we ended up adopting, excuse me, we ended up pursuing independent adoption first because we went to a workshop that talked about um, the benefits of private adoption. So that's what we decided to try first because uh, it would bypass going through an adoption, a placement adoption agency, which um, could potentially have saved us tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, basically, what an adoption agency does is it is the plays the middleman and um, does the networking for you and tries to find, um, tries to match uh, people with kids who are wanting to make an adoption plan for them and people without kids who are wanting to adopt. Basically, uh, there as we found out, there's a lot of scammers. There's a lot of people who don't even have kids um, that they're trying to place for adoption that are trying to get money out of people. Um, because it could be a very desperate situation for a lot of people. So, um, for a lot of people trying to adopt, I mean. So that's something else that the adoption agencies presumably do, is they weed through all of the scammers and they, you know, counsel um, anybody that comes to them. Um, now, I, at this point, I don't think they do a terribly good job, but that's supposedly what we would be paying for. So we decided we're going to do our own networking, we're going to weed through the scammers on our own, um, so that was fun. And um, yeah, and <clears throat> so we pursued independent adoption for, we, we said we were only going to do it for about six months, but we started getting leads that way. And so we ended up thinking, oh, the next one is going to, you know, if this is easier than we thought, the next one's going to work out. Um, so we ended up pursuing it for much longer than uh, initially uh, anticipated. Um, basically what we did, as far as our networking, we had set up an email account, a toll-free number, uh, put out flyers, took out ads in various newspapers around the country, might I add, um, with, the, with the purpose of um, 
trying to get in for, you know trying to get potential anybody that might be interested in um, placing for adoption contacting us and then we would kind of weave through all the scammers and everything um, we got t-shirts printed that we would wear if we went to like large um, events with a lot of people that said um, hoping to adopt you know in, in with our email address and things like that um, we started a support group for other people going through private adoption so that maybe we could pass around leads if like one one lead was not a good match for one family, maybe it would be good for another one. Um, and we set up an account on a website called parentprofiles.com, which uh, basically the potential adoptive parents um, set up uh, an account with their with pictures, with um, letter, with a letter to the potential um, birth mother, and just kind of describe themselves, talk about why they want to adopt and what they feel like they have to offer. Um, a child, and then the potential um, expect the expected mothers who may or may not decide to place for adoption will look through these um, profiles and contact anybody that they think they might be interested in, you know, considering um, as adoptive parents for their child. So that was the premise of that. Um, the first lead that we got, and we've, you know, I've, I've obviously I'm trying not to. Use any, I'm not using any identifying information, um, uh, but there are some details that really kind of, the whole point of me doing this video is to share some of the details to show just how kind of, um, how much drama has to be in place in somebody's life in order to even entertain the idea of, of placing your child for adoption before there's any kind of... Um, Corruption on the part of like adoption professionals or anything like that even even before any of that enters the picture So the first um, lead that we had was through our support group one of the members in our support group Woke up one morning and thought of us and had re remembered a lead that she had had uh, like five months previously um, And then she thought that they, it would be a good lead for us because we were specifically looking for Hispanic babies um, Did my husband is Hispanic and she had remembered that the father of this baby was supposedly Hispanic. So she contacted us. We emailed the person that I guess was, um, what had reached out to her was the grandmother of the baby. So we contacted the grandmother, um, who was thrilled to hear from us. At this point, the baby was five months old. Okay, so at this point, the, the, the woman, had the mother had had the baby, had parented the baby for a little bit, I think. But um, it was kind of un unclear. This was a lead that we went back and forth to over over a period of over a year, back and forth, back and forth. So um, we met with the grandmother. We met with both parents. Both parents um, seemed on board and, and were interested. They were, you know, young kids. Um, the mother, the baby's mother had um, Isaiah. We're going to call the baby Isaiah, Okay. Um, Isaiah's mother had been adopted by the grandmother that was in touch with me, and um, and she has he, she was struggling with some mental health issues that resulted in kind of be hanging with the wrong crowds. Um, drugs entered the picture. She spent some time in jail. Um, I don't remember what the what the deal with the father was. It turned out it was a different father actually than the than the Hispanic guy that we um, expected. But by then we kind of we felt we were vested. So the mother was um, white, and the father was either black or biracial. I don't remember biracial, black, white. Um, we had pictures of the little boy already that had been born, Isaiah. So um, usually that's you know not the case. Uh, like I said, he was five months old when I first contacted them. But by the time we you know, I, uh, by the time we we met with both parents and the grandmother at that point. Months had passed, um, and um, the mother was no longer parenting um, the baby. Her, um, the other grandmother, like the the dad's mother, was parenting the baby, uh, but she wasn't trying to do it long term. And so, at one point, I actually had a phone conversation with the other grandmother, um, whom I never met in person, and. I remember she was kind of 
it sounded like she was preparing me for kind of taking over the job because she was telling me what the little boy liked to eat, um, what he, what were his preferences, you know, things like that, his schedule. So I was really surprised that she was telling me all of these things. Um, I mean, he was over a year old by the time, you know, we were talking about this. Um, but unfortunately, even though the grandmother was parenting him, social services had gotten involved, and as we would learn over the next over the the next couple of years, um, one social services is on your back. You can't get them off your back. Um, it's a pain. You want to avoid that at all costs. Um, we spoke with uh, with an attorney that was involved in their case, whether or not because the grandmother who initially contacted us, or who, who, whom we initially contacted, rather, um, really wanted us to parent her grandson. She didn't want the other grandmother. We should have known that was a red flag because this is not something for the grandparents to decide. This is a decision that the parents have to make um, and not under any kind of um, duress. So, you know, that w was a red flag that it was trying, it was being orchestrated by this one grandmother who didn't like the other grandmother and who wanted a particular upbringing. She had raised her daughter who had, she had adopted as a single mother and, you know, she struggled with that. So she wanted a two parent uh, family for her grandson, da, 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 da. Should have known not to get involved with that. But at any rate, um, eventually, as it was starting to get a little bit closer, there was a case coming up, um, a hearing to determine the best interest of, of, um, of Isaiah, whether he would stay with his grandmother or go into um, foster care or whether we could be considered as his adoptive parents since his parents did um, like that option. Then the grandmother that we had been in touch with out of the blue um, tells us that he may be a carrier of a terminal life, you know, life-threatening condition and that she won't know until her daughter is tested and her daughter couldn't be tested until she's like in her 20s. I forget what the name of the condition was, but it was very convoluted. So she was, the daughter was going to be tested soon to find out whether or not she was a carrier. If she was a carrier, then Isaiah might have been a carrier, but there would be no way to know whether it would affect him or not until he was much older. So it was very, very scary. We, we, I mean, we did not want to adopt a child that would, you know, grow up only to die for crying out loud. That is really just, um, call it selfish or whatnot, but that was just not what we were trying. We were not trying to be saints. Um, so that really gave me pause. At first, I thought, well, you know, you never know if you have a child born to you. They can, they might be born sick and you just suck it up and, you know, you do the best you can. But after some more reflection, I realized that we do have the option um, and we shouldn't just lackadaisically kind of go into a situation that could be potentially so serious. Plus the fact that social services was already involved. By By this time... Isaiah was 18 months old, and he had um, been placed with foster parents who wanted to adopt him. And so we just thought, you know what, who are we to try to interfere with that? He had started the bonding process already with these foster parents. They were clearly um, deemed um, qualified enough for, you know, whatever potential medical issues he may have. So we thought, you know what, no, we, we will have to wait. This is not... Um, the, in the best interest of anybody involved, in, but in particular, Isaiah. Uh, just a quick kind of um, side note, years later when our daughter was um, baptized, I had invited this grandmother and this mo mother um, to the baptism. I really thought that it was kind of a nice um, symbolic kind of gesture from where I was standing to, to kind of show that... Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, but I really know that I really appreciated having them there, and they, um, and I guess they they also appreciated. So she had uh, at that point cleaned up her act. She was pregnant with her um, the fiance at that point. So um, and then she showed me pictures of Isaiah, you know, who had been with the foster family, or rather with his adoptive family at this point. Um, so she had an open adoption arrangement um, with the foster parents. So it just it gave me an opportunity to kind of see how that situation unfolded without me being a, par uh, you know, a part of it. 
that so that was our first lead um, and I'm gonna pause here um, and tell you all about the second lead um, in the next video